Our next speaker is Kate Schlichting. She has really done an excellent job in this program, right from the beginning, really got the science extraordinarily well, and it's been really a pleasure to have in the program. A, a great classmate, uh, definitely some great leadership skills and a lot of talent, um, both on the policy side and the science side. So probably one of the most, um, one of the better students we've had in this program. No pressure or anything, Kate, for your capstone, but uh, Kate did a great job this year and picked a really important, interesting topic because right now, um, sustainable, you know, aviation isn't the biggest piece of the puzzle, but it'll get bigger. So this is a high leverage opportunity to make a difference here with this uh, particular idea. So Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you. He's stealing my talking points, so. But you did pronounce my name right. <laughs> All right, uh, as you heard, my name's Kate Schlichting and I'm here to talk to you about sustainable aviation fuel today, in particular, opportunities and challenges for bringing it down to San Diego. And we'll cover a little bit about aviation emissions uh, today and where they're going, some of the challenges with decarbonizing aviation in general, uh, what sustainable aviation fuel is and barriers to adoption of it more broadly, and then we'll wrap up with uh, what that looks like for San Diego and policies and programs that influence its adoption. So first of all, aviation emissions make up two to three percent of global emissions, and the same ratio applies here in the United States. And while that doesn't seem like a lot, it's important to pay attention now because that is a growing piece of the pie. Uh, unlike a lot of other sectors that have headway already being made into reducing the emissions and, and reaching that peak so we can start um, actually going down and hopefully reaching less than two degrees C, uh, aviation doesn't have that trajectory right now. Uh, and if you look at a couple of different estimates for how it's going to grow into the future, you're looking at greater than 50% fuel consumption by 2050 um, based off the World Economic Forum data and other estimates from ICAO that says two to three times more emissions from 2015 levels in 2045. So significant growth is expected to happen unless we do something to address it. And then that leads to kind of the challenges that come with decarbonizing aviation in general. So the first thing is that compared to their on-road counterparts, aircraft last a long time. So whether you're talking about tractor trailers or passenger vehicles, the general lifespan of those vehicles is less than 15 years. Whereas aircraft you're gonna have in the air and flying around for 25 to 30 years. So even if we had the cleanest technology for both on-road and uh, the aviation sector today, it's gonna take a longer time for that technology to permeate into the aircraft industry. And then also some of our long-term decarbonization options so that deep decar decarbonization for aviation is just a little bit more difficult. So right now they're looking primarily at hydrogen and electric airplanes and electric, uh, we know the batteries are, are heavy and that's hard to uh, reconcile with flying in the air with it. So the battery weights just aren't there yet. And even though they have some free commercial planes available, those are four to eight seats and they're short, short haul flights. Whereas the vast majority of emissions come from those mid long range flights. And then hydrogen does have a, a little bit of a weight advantage on um, batteries. However, we don't have the infrastructure in place to get hydrogen from production facilities uh, to all of the airports. And that would be a whole nother hurdle to overcome and, and why that's much more of a, a long term plan for decarbonizing aviation. And there's a lot of other things we can do. So there's cont continuous descent operations actually flying in a straight line over Europe. Uh, and other things that is going to get us those, you know, one to three percent fuel efficiency gains, which will be important. However, I think that a sustainable aviation fuel is kind of a bigger piece of the pie for meaningful decarbonization now and in the midterm. So what is sustainable aviation fuel? There's two key parts I want to talk about. One is that it's alternative. So alternative means pretty much anything that's not fossil fuel based. And I realized after the fact I put oil up here. I mean, waste oils such as vegetable oils and things like that. Um, and then municipal solid waste, uh, biomass such as tree trimmings, all of that can be used to produce sustainable aviation fuels through, again, a wide variety of feedstocks and pathways. But when we say that, we mean alternative, anything that's not a fossil fuel based fuel. And then also sustainable. So they also don't like to use the term biojet or biofuel anymore because that fails to acknowledge the sustainable aspect. In the past, with some of our ethanol blending and gasoline, that hasn't been as successful in being as environmentally friendly as we want because there's some, uh, some land use changes that have occurred that weren't intended. So when we, look, we talk about sustainable, we truly mean trying to address uh, non-direct effects and not just reduced emissions. And then the biggest part that makes this so exciting, especially for the industry, is that it's a drop in fuel. That means once the fuel's blended, you can use it in all of our infrastructure and in all of our airplanes that are out there today. And it's currently being used. So you don't have an extra piece of the puzzle to like retrofit engines or airplanes or storage tanks. 
Um, it's once it's blended, it's a drop in fuel. And then the benefits. So obviously the key benefit we're looking for here is your emissions reductions. And we're talking about life cycle emissions reductions. So if you compare uh, conventional fossil fuel based jet fuel to sustainable aviation fuel, what comes out of the tailpipe, so to say, is pretty similar. But when you're producing it, uh, you have less emissions over the, over the whole life cycle of the fuel. And that's important. And the way I like to think about it is when you have those fossil fuels, you're taking that carbon out of, out of the carbon sink in the ground and you're emitting it into the atmosphere. For these alternative fuels, you're taking it from other places in the biosphere and then emitting it in the atmosphere. But it, all, all in all, when you take the whole life cycle into account, it's much lower amount of emissions. And then there's other benefits. Um, it has lower sulfur content and aromatics, so there's less particulate mat matter, um, better for you know, local air pollution and things of that nature, and public health. And some long-term benefits could be reduced maintenance, greater thermal stability, influencing engine design, things like that. So a lot of good things can happen. And we kind of need it to happen. So if you look at any, any projections uh, for reducing aviation emissions, and I mean actually reducing them, not just offsetting them, which is a large part of the industry's plan right now, uh, sustainable aviation fuel has a huge role to play. Uh, so you can see that top line is, is where we would be business as usual. That bottom line is the goals of the aviation industry in general, which is capping at 2020 levels. And green is what they plan to do with uh, alternative fuels, sustainable aviation fuel. So it's super necessary <laughs> that we scale this and, and get it ad adopted today because that's what's actually going to meaningfully reduce the sector over the next 30 years. Uh, barriers to SAF adoption. The big one is cost. If it was cheaper than fossil fuel, it would already be you know, throughout the market. market. So we have here on the right a lot of different prices, uh, and you can see that that dashed line is conventional jet fuel, um, whereas a lot of different uh, sustainable aviation fuel is a lot higher at the moment. And while those were lower, um, we need other incentives to get people to actually buy it and, and supplant their fossil fuel with it. Another big barrier is feedstock competition. Renewable diesel is co-produced with sustainable aviation fuel. So there's a large market for renewable diesel. Uh, obviously, on-road vehicles in general is, a, is a, a very large market. But also, there's a lot of policy incentives that favor renewable diesel over sustainable aviation fuel. So we're talking, you know, it could be easily 30 cents here in California um, to as of a price premium for renewable diesel over SAF, which is why it's produced a lot less than its renewable diesel counterpart. And then I mentioned policy that influences everything. So policy is needed to make uh, a market incentive for people to actually buy the fuel in the first place and needed to be reconfigured to look at SAF more than just renewable diesel and supply infrastructure. I mentioned that once the fuel is blended, it's ready to go into any of our pipelines and things like that. However, it does need to get blended first. So this isn't the same hurdle as getting hydrogen to all of our airports. It's a much smaller one, but it's still important. And essentially what that means is you take your your 100% biofuel, um, sustainable aviation fuel, and you mix it with some conventional jet fuel, and now you have the blended fuel, and then that can go in all of our existing storage tanks, pipelines, et cetera. And that leads us to the primary options uh, for getting it to San Diego. So of looking at the existing supply infrastructure for San Diego Airport, and also where producers are at the moment, and what infrastructure is available along the way, the best option would be to get it into the pipeline up in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles has a lot of oil refineries. It has a port that imports, I believe, 50 million barrels of fuel a year. Um, and it's located uh, 10 miles from the only major producer of SAF in the country. So if we can get the blended fuel from the World Energy Plant that's up there into one of those terminals, it can enter in our pipeline and go straight to San Diego that way. Uh, alternatively, terminals are basically oil storage, um, oil product storage and distribution centers. So they have blending technology on site and they generally certify things there as well. So you can uh, you leverage that as a potential blending site when capacities increase as well. And then less desirably would be options down here closer to the actual airport, which would be the 10th Avenue Marine Terminal. They have three jet A storage tanks on site there, uh, but it is a rail connected and obviously port connected terminal, which opens up the opportunities to get fuel from other locations. In particular, when I think about uh, the 10th Avenue terminal, I think, oh, well, there's a huge producer, Neste, that produces out in Singapore. So there's the potential for maybe getting an offtake agreement with them and that oil coming in through the San Diego port. And the least desirable option would be truck offloading at the San Diego airport directly. We don't want to add traffic congestion and emissions from that. Uh, so that's less than desirable, but I could imagine that if we have a local producer in the county then that and have small quantities, that could be an option as well. And then there's a lot of other considerations for getting uh, 
fuel to the airport. Essentially, the, it, the airport is a very sustainable airport. If you're not familiar with it, it has a lot of initiatives to reduce their emissions, and they only have so much they, that they can control. In particular, fuels bought by the airlines. So even though it's stared, uh, stored on site, they don't have much say in the fuel that's purchased. So for them, it's about getting everyone to the table, uh, talking to the producers and talking to the purchasers and saying, hey, you have some available here. Hey, we wanna get it down here in San Diego. Let's all talk about how we can make this happen. Um, and there's existing offtake agreements for that fuel that's produced up in, in LA, for example, and it's primarily used at the LA airport, but that's another opportunity. Like United Airlines is a big purchaser of theirs and their hub down here in San Diego. So that could be part of the conversation of, hey, how about we expand how much you're offtaking and get some of that fuel redirected down here. And then I don't really have time to go into the producers very much, I don't think. So um, I'll go ahead and go to policies and programs. Uh, actually, I'm going really fast. <laughs> One of the big policies that is affecting SAF production is the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. Uh, about in 2019, SAF became an eligible product, but conventional jet fuel didn't produce a deficit. So it's great for the airline industry in that they don't have to pay anything for using conventional jet fuel, but they can get slightly cheaper uh, fuel uh, via SAF. And the baseline's a little bit low. And what that means is that we talked about renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. They have the same carbon intensity when they're co-produced. And therefore, you would think they would get the same benefit under California's program. However, the baseline's different. And in 2023, that's going to change. So that presents a really amazing opportunity for greater SAF production and consumption in California, opening up, again, the opportunity for San Diego Airport. The federal renewable fuel standard, uh, renewable diesel is favored there, but there is some money to be had from production that way. And then also from the program perspective, there's passenger and corporation engagement. And I think of United because, again, they have some good examples for this. They have an Eco Skies Alliance where they basically engage corporations to offset their emissions by contributing to some of their initiatives, including sustainable aviation fuel. So I think something like that is something that could be capitalized at the airport as well, though I would recommend that you really highlight uh, the additive nature of it. So if a passenger donates or buys SAF credits essentially to offset their flight, then you want to make sure that, okay, this is the additional amount that's going in, and any other investments are tabulated separately. And then there's a lot of proposed policy at the federal level right now. Um, my favorite is the Sustainable Aviation Fuel Act. It's very comprehensive. It asks the, or mandates the EPA to establish a low carbon fuel standard that's aviation specific, which would be huge. Um, however, that's probably the part of that particular policy that's gonna receive the most backlash because it would increase airline operating costs at a time that they're decimated in the post COVID world. And to give you an exam example, airlines, their fuel costs are about 23, 20 to 30% of operating costs. So that's not something that's easy to tack on additional prices for. But it does a lot of other things as well. It creates national goals for reducing aviation emissions. It um, has a tax credit in there, which is definitely the favorite part because it offers $1.50 per gallon for any, uh, any fuel that offsets 50% or greater uh, carbon emissions and a few other things. And so that has been proposed the last two sessions, but it hasn't moved forward yet. Um, and then there's a separate beer bill, that's the tax credit only, essentially. And then there's also the American Jobs Act, which includes the tax credit. Whether or not any of those will happen, you know, we'll, we'll find out. There's a lot of climate priorities that are on the list at the moment. And so hopefully sustainable aviation fuels get some of that. And there is definitely that federal appetite, which is always encouraging. And that means obviously recognition as well that this is a sector that could use some assistance in reducing emissions now. And I realized I went very quickly, but <laughs> if you have any questions, now's the time. Great job, thank you, Kate. Did the current administration, um, the, the infrastructure plan, have anything in it related to sustainable aviation fuels? Yeah, uh, and just a little bit, and I actually did was able to include a little bit of that on the slide. So the American Jobs Act, which doesn't actually have legislative text yet to my knowledge, but they did include some details in the budget um, description, and it has that tax credit, and that would be $1.50 per gallon, essentially, for sustainable aviation fuels that can offset greater than 50% emissions and they get an extra cent, I believe, for every additional 2% uh, emissions reductions. So I think that particular aspect of the policy was included because it, there's not as much appetite to go against uh, free money for corporations. So lobbying will probably support that. However, 
because we have a lot of uh, fiscal conservative um, mindsets, especially when it comes to climate spending, that would be harder to include. And fund number, it's 6.6 .6 billion over a decade is what they would expect that particular tax credit to cost in foregone revenue. Okay. Anybody in the room? Uh, Chrissy. Um, amazing job, Kate. So I was wondering, um, I'm very curious as what you're going to go over for the producers. You said you would skip that. Sorry. Um, you uh, mentioned like the producers <coughs> with the Nestle and oh, yeah, were yeah. you going to mention anything about that? No, I can definitely talk about the producers a little bit because you're right. I did kind of shorten my presentation a bit. Uh, so World Energy, which is that LA producer, and then Neste are the, the two global players in sustainable aviation fuel right now. Um, and so World Energy is a huge opportunity because they are located so close to San Diego and already near all of, all of our supply infrastructure. And as I mentioned, Neste, they have a plant out in Singapore that currently produces, and they're doing a huge um, upgrade to the plants. So that way there's going to be a lot more production coming out of there. So that would be, I think, the next major opportunity because they also have production facilities in Europe but there's probably gonna be a big enough market there that it would seem more reasonable to pull um, some supply from Singapore. And then there's two that are being built, again, um, with that more competitive credit in 2023. I think that's definitely one of the drivers that's getting uh, sustainable aviation fuel and renewable diesel plants built a little bit more. Uh, Fulcrum Bioenergy and Red Rock Biofuels. One's in Oregon, one's in Nevada, I forget which. Um, but they're pretty small amounts. So they're producing, I believe, 11 and 16 million gallons of total product a year. And while that might be something that could have a decent amount contributed to sustainable aviation fuel, Oregon has their own version of a low carbon fuel standard, so that market's probably gonna get some. And then the other one in Nevada is, you know, <coughs> it'd be hard to get it down in San Diego versus in nearby San Francisco where that particular product will be processed already, so. Anybody else? Congratulations. Uh, when you, if you mention this and I missed it, I do apologize, but when you mention biofuel, what is the source of the biofuel that you were referring to? At one point, people were trying hard with algal oils, but cost was such a barrier. Are, are they still working on that? Uh, you know, I, I didn't dig into all the pathways nearly as much because there's so much out there. I think there's six or seven approved pathways right now. Um, I don't, that one doesn't ring a bell for one of the production methods, but there's a great sustainable aviation fuel guys that digs into all the different pathways and they're constantly reviewing additional pathways, which is unfortunately another barrier because it is a very expensive and time consuming process to authorize additional fuels. Um, but yeah, so I, I couldn't answer that specific one. And the costs are high. I don't know if you saw on my other graph, but like uh, liquid, uh, excuse me, power to liquid is a huge opportunity into the future, in my opinion, but that relies on carbon capture and things of that nature, and it's extremely expensive right now, but in 2050, that might be another story. Thank you so much, Kate. Great job.